Hello, and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff. Tonight, I'm your host, Joe, and with me are Aaron, Devin. All right. And uh, Aaron, what are you drinking tonight? I have uh, the Laser Snake IPA from Three Floyds. It's the I... one that I had a couple weeks ago that has the giant artillery on top of a giant cobra, a robotic <laughs> cobra. Nice. It's awesome. It's all neon and awesome. Ian, what are you drinking? Uh, Makers and Diet Coke. Nice. Exactly what you should be drinking. (laughs) And Devin? I'm finishing off this Tres uh, Generoses uh, that I was drinking on last time. Oh, nice. And tonight I have one of our favorite beers on the show, Dank Meme from Triptic Brewing. Yay! It's so good. It's not from a keg, though. All right. So um, tonight we have one news topic that is the catalyst for our show's topic. And it's a sad topic that I was absolutely crushed to hear about this week. Uh, This week, uh, Make Media announced its insolvency as a business and laid off all of its 22 employees and canceled the two big maker fairs and uh, the Bay Area Maker Fair and the New York Maker Fair. And uh, for me, this was a pretty crushing blow because I have never had an opportunity to go to either of the two big fairs. And I was planning on going to at least one of them this year, and I was really hoping for New York. But... um, you know, with uh, with that happening, while it is sad, it I think has had a positive note in the maker community where I haven't seen this much community camaraderie and outcry in the maker community as I have this week in years. What do you guys think? There's certainly a lot of people coming out saying, uh, you know, it, it, it is sad, but they don't define the entire community, you know? So like th- there were, there were maker type events before make, uh, there's going to be maker type events after, you know, make. So, yeah, you know, I think they're all right. I, th- I think we're, I think we're all going to be just fine. Ian, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, you know, we, we made things and we shared what we made, um, before, Maker Media started Maker Fair, and I, I think, you know, Dale and and that team did a did a wonderful thing by by creating Make Magazine and Maker Fair. Uh, but you know, they only produced two of the fairs, uh, New York and and the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, you know, the the hundreds of fairs around the world and the, the millions of global attendees. Uh, you know, that was really Maker Fair producers in their in their individual communities. And those people are still there and alive and well and kicking and still wanting to produce Maker events. So uh, I, I think you're right. I think it, it changes the definition a little bit, but we're, we're going to move on. Who are you again? Who are you again, Ian? Oh, uh, so my name's Ian. Uh, I am one of the founders of the Maker Effect Foundation. Uh, we produce Maker Fair Orlando. We also um, uh, operate Maker FX Makerspace in Orlando. Nice, nice. It, can you tell us a little bit about your Makerspace? Sure. We are uh, currently uh, what are we six thousand five hundred square feet at this point. We we added more last year. Uh, yesterday was the two year anniversary of our grand opening, but um, really, we you know we've had a long uh, community history in Orlando. Uh, Famalab started, uh, I think, close to 10 years ago. Uh, we've got another space named Factor. Uh, and so uh, while Maker Effects is only two years old, it, it doesn't really tell the story because the other spaces have been there for, for much longer. And we just sort of filled out the, the geography by opening a space on the, on the south side of town near the theme parks. Oh, nice. Yeah. What's like a defining factor for your space? Like, I, I feel like every space has something that like makes them special. Maybe D- does your space have anything that stands out? 
I mean, yeah, you're right. I think there's definitely a, a flavor for each space. And, and I think for us, it's the combination that that it, it is a space and it is full of tools, uh, but it's also kind of the home base of our foundation and the efforts around Maker Faire. So it's, it's actually really common to see members of other spaces in our space because they're there uh, participating in some organizing for the fair. Uh, we have a lot of community groups that meet and use our space, whether it's the, the R2 builders or the 501st. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's one of the things that makes it a little different. You know, we've got some of the same tools that everybody else has, but, but it is that sort of combination of, of fair and space together that, that make it interesting. Very cool. I can give you a, actually a, a really good example of that. Uh, in our shop, uh, not assembled, we have a combat robot arena that's a 32 foot by 16 foot uh, steel and uh, Lexan enclosure. Um, not everybody's got one of those laying around, but we we acquired that last year because the people who fight the big combat robots in Florida needed uh, a way to fight them, and the arena. Uh, that was owned by someone was actually rusting away. So we, we bought it and, and started a refurb process. And now we've got yeah. this big hunk of steel. That's awesome. <laughs> That's great. So our local Maker Fest, we went the unbranded route for our Maker event, um, which I'd actually like to talk to you guys about that later in the episode. Uh, we host the Midwest's largest bot brawl. So they go up to, I think, five pound bots in that one. And last year we had about 70 competitors in it. And five pound. It, wow, that's cute. Oh, yeah. sorry. Well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Shots fired. Cirque, we got to talk. Apparently we need bigger robots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a big discussion in our area. We we've got a bunch of the the smaller ones, and then and then they go up to the um, the 200 plus pound class, which which definitely freaks me out. Uh, wow. They can't they can't use the high energy weapons, um, but watching those things fly around in there, and there's um because I South Florida for some reason has this huge concentration of uh, robots from TV. And uh, okay. so we end up with, uh, I think we had five of those competitors uh, last year with modified robots that were fighting. And it's uh, it's pretty intense. Just the five pound robots scare me when they get going. <laughs> so I yeah. can only imagine the 200 pound. Holy crap. Now imagine moving the enclosure that those things fight in. Two 26 foot trucks. And uh, I think we had eight people last year. Yeah. I'm, your, your fest is in... What's the dates for your Maker Fair? Uh, November 9th and 10th. So we are um, uh, Veterans Day weekend. Uh, we moved to that weekend last year because it's um, apparently it's like hot in Florida. Oh. And we just kept fighting the, the weather and fighting the weather. We moved we moved from September into October and then October into November. And, and November seems to be, be a, a good spot for us. So we're going to keep going there. Nice. What's the weather like in Florida in November? less brutal um <laughs> you know you you hope to get you hope to get a cool weekend where it you know might be in the 70s or 80s uh but it could also be in the 90s it just really depends well here in illinois it's like snowing that weekend so <laughs> well that's why we get a lot of combat robot competitors from places like that and uh, we also get a lot of power racing series entrants who are uh escaping places like detroit that time of year so yeah aaron you, do you hear my mind working <laughs> i guess my next question um devin do you guys you guys host a maker fair right yeah we help with the mini maker fair it's technically ran by the library um they handle okay. all that stuff um with our new space coming online we're planning on seeing about moving that in-house that's right. I remember you guys saying that. So you're actually going to host it in your makerspace. We 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 just might because we've got ten thousand square, and then the the whole downstairs below us is empty. So okay. the, there's like fifty thousand square foot of empty space that we can just wow. use. 
Wow. Okay. Yeah. I would host it there too. So what made you guys decide to go with the branded Maker Fair route? So like you guys paid the licensing fees to make and and did all of that. What made you guys decide to go with that route versus doing all the legwork yourself for your event? Ian, you want to take that? Well, I can tell you for us, I mean, we we didn't, I mean, this was back in 2011. Um, you know, we went and saw Maker Fair Bay Area. I took my son there when he was 11. And uh, another friend from the Makerspace went and, you know, the whole, the whole scene at Bay Area was just, just intoxicating. Uh, the, the people, the community, the spectacle of it. Um, so I don't know that we even really considered not doing branded. It, it seemed like um, almost an honor to be trusted with the brand and to, to bring it to uh, our community. And so, yes, there was a license fee, but, you know, I've worked in branded companies before and, and the license fee didn't scare me. And, you know, it, it lets you participate in part of a community of something bigger. It gave you something in common with with uh, a number of other people. And Make also had had some infrastructure, especially at those time at that time, um, a playbook to get started, a, a website template and some other pieces. So I, I don't know that we really even thought about going unbranded at that time. Yeah, we were just inspired by what we were seeing in Make Magazine. So uh, the first one I went to was actually the first year we did a mini maker fair uh, in our town. And then, you know, we it was it was a big hit. Um, and then that's when I started going to Pittsburgh and Detroit and New York and seeing all the bigger, you know, maker fairs and being like, oh, OK, this is this is <laughs> this is what this is all about. So how many fairs have you guys gone to as uh, participants rather than exhibitors? Like, so you had no involvement in the fair. You were just going for fun and to see the fair itself. I wish you could see my my confused face. I'm like, wait, you can do that? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? That was my my reaction this year when I did that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I went to Bay Area in 2011 with my son for the first time, uh, and that was, you know, that was a, a no commitment, uh, you know, just just take it in fair. Went to Kansas City more as a as a uh, kind of research recon trip just to see what what they did uh, you know they were they were a featured fair uh, early on I wanted to see a, a two day that would be more at the scale that we would run so that was really educational and then Bay Area in I want to say it was 17 I had scheduling trouble and so I couldn't actually commit to anything. And then at the very last minute, I managed to fly out like Saturday afternoon and just showed up with no job. And everybody's like, hey, what are you doing here? Why aren't you helping? I'm like, well, I, I didn't plan well. And then I'm thinking, maybe I planned really well, actually. So that one was a lot of fun just hanging out. And I've been to a bunch, been to a bunch of others, but I've always, I've almost always volunteered or helped in some way because you're there and <laughs> they always need help. So, yeah. you know, why not why not jump in and 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 be part of it? Yeah, that was when I went to Milwaukee, uh when I met you I and I I ended up I was walking around with my daughter all day and then at one point I just walked up to Pete and I was like, "Do you guys need help with anything?" cuz <laughs> I don't know what to do with my hands right now. I'm just like hanging out. <laughs> and he's like, "No, no, just enjoy the fair." And I don't know how but isn't that. that the best part of the maker community? <laughs> I mean, that's that's really what makes this community special is is that that bias towards service and being useful and being helpful. Uh, I, I think that's really a, a big part of, of what makes it amazing. Yes, I totally agree. Are, are you aware of the producer in residence program? No. So. This is, um, you know, this is something that Make started, and it was where Maker Fair producers could go work, Bay Area or New York, and the premise was, uh, you know, <laughs> you provide free labor and you learn something along the way, and and you know they would cover, 
you know, sort of like food and, and I think hotel cost. Um, and we heard about that and we thought, wow, that's a, that's a really neat idea. And our crew is always, you know, looking for extra help. So, so we put that call out and the last few years, um, you know, people like Chad from Pittsburgh and Pete from Milwaukee have, um, have come down in a, you know, in a formal way. And, you know, we provide lodging and, and, you know, try to help with travel costs if we can. And they, you know, they're, they're boots on the ground. And it's amazing because, um, you know, when things don't go right, having another producer there is so empowering because you know they get it. And you know you can just point them at an area and say, you know, go fix my front gate. It's blowing up right now. And they go, okay. You know, and when I went to Milwaukee, um, you know, Pete did that with me. And I, I stood up front greeting people in Milwaukee at, you know, 10 in the morning, just making sure that the the flow of attendees was right coming in the doors just to get things, you know, get things tuned. Um, right. It's just a really neat way to, to help others. Huh. No, I hadn't heard about that, but now I'm going to look into it. <laughs> that is a, re- that's a really cool way to um, help other maker makers travel to your fair too. Uh, it makes perfect sense for how our community operates, I think. So we, are on our sixth year of producing Maker Fest. I think it's six years. I don't know. I stopped counting after the first year because it's like, I'm just going to do this until they tell me I can't. But we looked into doing um, an official, at least a mini fair. And really the reason that we didn't was um, kind of the limitations that were put on the producers as what we could do. because. When we came up with the idea to do our our fest, our Maker Fest in Peoria, um, we partnered with our art society, and we put on this creation fair called uh, mm. Ignite Peoria. Um, that is along with our um, our arts community, and we run half of it. It's called Midwest Maker Fest, and it's along with like a full blown fine arts fair and performing arts fair and uh when it started early on it was uh combined with a um an ethnic fest called world fest and all of the ethnic restaurants in the area and ethnic stores in the area would bring food and and really cool stuff and uh feed everybody Um, sounds like a good time it was an it's an amazing time what it's really allowed us to do is one our the entire event is free for everyone participants and exhibitors um we do like sponsors uh we always need more sponsors um we're usually happy to break even at this event um but the initial mini maker fair rules wouldn't let us partner with the art community the way we wanted to or needed to to make that happen which is why we didn't end up doing a branded fair in peoria ever i feel like that kind of held them back a little bit yeah i I would agree with that I understand a bit from a brand standpoint about not wanting to have your brand relegated to be, uh, you know, a sub event of something else. Um, and I've, I've seen make struggle, you know, with this model, um, in Gainesville, Florida, for example. Um, you know, and I think if you're, if you're saying that was six or six or eight years ago, I think they were a lot more strict on those rules then as well. I think the last few years they they lightened up a bit. You know, hey, in in hindsight now, you've got a name and you can continue using your name and you're not, you know, caught up in all of the uh the licensing drama and questions that are that are going on right now. So, you know, who knows, maybe that was a a really fortuitous decision. Yeah, I maybe, I don't know. It when Dale brought up the idea of doing a Chicago Maker Fair that was going to be a big Midwest regional fair. Um, it was going to be a flagship like uh, the Bay Area and the New York Fair. Uh, he called, uh, got a hold of us as maker curators, basically to find really awesome people to come to to Chicago and participate in the event. And part of the call. Uh, he was asking me about my background producing events and I brought up maker fest and I kind of gave him the gist of it. And he was absolutely blown away that we were putting on a 
four to five thousand person event without any um make support and uh, he asked us why we hadn't done a uh, mini maker fair or tried to do like a regional fair and i, I was pretty upfront with him i was on why and that was two years ago and I, he i think he got it he he was he took a minute and he was just kind of like the way that event sounds like it works, it sounds like it works really well and kind of brings all of these societies together. Maybe we should take a look at that. So maybe that's why they relaxed those rules maybe a little bit. I don't know. It it was a really good conversation and I'm sad that the Chicago fair never happened uh, the way they intended. I was surprised when it was announced. <laughs> Well, yeah, it, <laughs> it was it was announced so close to the date that they were going to have the event. I I was like, are you sure this is going to work? And they're like, it's going to be great. <laughs> well, and they so. had the same thing happen with London. And, you know, these these mega expensive cities, right? You know, producing an event in Chicago. Um, I I don't know how the economics on that. At, at maker fair scale work and I, I guess they you know hopefully they were but what's interesting is wasn't that event going to be a uh, a simultaneous event with uh comic-con yeah it was going to be simultaneous with c2e2 and yeah. i think that was how they were going to uh, afford the venue gotcha. because it was it was going to be at mccormick place which is astronomically expensive yeah. to host an event at but you know, also very, very cool to have your event at. So um, to be able to partner with C2E2, I think would have been huge uh, and very fortuitous for both events. But Well, it makes you also wonder, um, you know, I wonder how much money was spent to figure that out and then not do that event, right? I wonder how much money was spent... Um, talking about an energy spent on something like London, you know, and that, that's, that's a, I've been thinking a lot the last week about the differences between the community driven makerspace model and maker media, right? It, it's two very, very different uh, organizational models. One's a, a for-profit company that uh, publishes a magazine and produces these two fairs and two of the most expensive places to produce events. Um, and they're out, you know, looking for growth, looking for, you know, new ways to do things versus the community events. So I think about, you know, like the risks that you would take in producing your event, you might say, well, I want to spend money on bringing in this new content. Um, and so you might overspend on a given year for your event. But that's different than just deciding out of the blue, hey, I'm going to go launch yet another big event someplace and, and sink a lot of money and time and effort and resources into it. And, and I, wonder, I wonder if that drive for expansion um, maybe led to some, some of the funding challenges. Oh, I, I completely agree. Because like, as a community-driven event, you know, all of the money that we have is sponsorship dollars. So we are incredibly diligent to make sure that we spend the money that we have, the tiny amount of money that we have in the most intelligent way possible and to try to grab as many in-kind sponsorships as we can so that we can run on as thin of a budget as we can. So we can put on this amazing event and make sure that everybody is happy at the end of the day. What's the, uh, what's the organizational entity um for your event like are, are you you operating under a 501c3 or what where, how's the funding work so our event is parented by our um, arts organization in peoria ah, called okay. arts partners and yeah it. it's a 501c3 so you, again differences in business models right we're, we're sitting here talking about these community events and and our community events that that we're discussing here uh are all nonprofits, which means uh, in its simplest form, not paying sales taxes, not paying uh, income taxes on on proceeds, which, you know, I don't know about you, but we, we have a hard enough time, as you were just saying, making, you know, making the financial model work to, 
to have to pay, you know, sales taxes and employment employees and employment taxes and, you know, income taxes on top of it, not to mention paying back investors would be, um, you know, a significant burden on the model. Yeah. And I think that's what bugs me is the, 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 the news articles right now don't really differentiate how, how what we do in producing these community events is somehow different than what Maker Media did. And that, you know, categorizing the failure of Maker Media doesn't, um, I, I don't believe it categorizes the health of our events. Right. And it's the same as when Tech Shop failed. And it made it the media made it sound like all makerspaces were going to die. Uh, I was in my makerspace all weekend. How about you? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. I work from my makerspace most days now. So it's so interesting how sensationalized things can get. Interesting is the best nice word I can come up with. <laughs> yeah, I also want to be sensitive too. You know, tech shops are really good. Tech shops are really interesting. Um, example it's different but but has some similar elements um because there were people displaced i think that's the thing i'd want to dwell on there is yeah. there were people who woke up one day and could not get to their project materials they woke up one day and they could not continue their business that they had started within tech shop um and and for the makers who have exhibited or attended, participated, whatever, at, at Bay Area, New York, you know, I, I want to recognize this is a huge loss for them. Uh, yes. For, for the, the, the remaining employees of Maker Media, and it's almost kind of scary to think it was, it was down to 22 people. I don't know how they were pulling off what they were pulling off with, with only the 22 people. Um, you know, it's a very real job loss for them. And so I, I, I think it is a it is a very real event, just like Tech Shop was a very real event. But as you mentioned, you know, those cities that, that lost their tech shop moved on, whether it's, um, you know, through the opening of another space or migrating to existing spaces, uh, just as, you know, maker fair or maker events are going to continue regardless of what they're called and regardless of whether or not there's a, a licensing entity for a specific, you know, trademark. So we're not just going to stop. Right. Well, and, and like beyond the people that lost their jobs, which is it's recognize what it is. It's terrible. I think losing make is sad on another point because make was a really great outlet for makers like me to get, recognized and published in a way that it was very it's very difficult to get published in a magazine if you're not producing the magazine or you don't know somebody that's producing the magazine so the first time i got a mag a project published was in make and our space has a couple people that have been in make and you know that's a really awesome chance to be put out in a national magazine and have your work recognized on a level like that. And I can't think of another place that would be able to, I would be able to get that opportunity right now. Yeah, I would imagine something will fill the void. Um, I, I agree with you. It was a great uh, platform for that. And it, and it, you know, what's interesting is I think as they, as they had more and more financial trouble, um, it it provide it, it opened up the content platform even more and it it led them to uh enable more and more people to to contribute so yeah that's a great question where will where will we go to to publish that type of of info yeah seems like it'll be uh, I... decentralized you know things like thingiverse uh Instructables, Instructables, Hack a Day, um, yeah, you know, there's all those. Yeah, but even even in Hack a Day, it's not super easy to get recognized. I've been trying yeah. to get a project in Hack a Day for, I don't know, five years. <laughs> He's got to make better stuff, Joe. Oh, <laughs> that's it. That's wow. it. Wow. <laughs> I, I just need to make better stuff. You're right, Aaron. <laughs> Straight to the balls. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Make also hadn't been seeing the um, 
the readership that they'd seen prior uh, because I had publishing rights on the make blog uh, I could see what stats were um, available for the posts that I had published and I can tell you three years ago was uh, significantly higher uh, than something I did earlier this year so um, you know I don't I don't I don't know what the drivers were that uh, of that were, and I, I really don't spend a lot of time analyzing the publishing side of the business. I think I spend more time thinking about the the event side of the business. But but something something was definitely amiss, and maybe it's just competition because you know there's so many so many things competing for for our time. So what that energy and that attention went somewhere. So where do you think it went? The, this is going to bring me into a grandstand moment that I have been wanting to do a podcast on for a while. But where, where do you guys think that energy went? You know, for me, I'll say, I think there was a point where our local community looked to make and other um, sources because we, we were aspiring. We didn't have those things in our town and local and at our fingertips. And over time, as we built those resources and had those people in our community and we found enough of our, of our tribe, I think maybe we got a little, um, uh, I don't know if myopic's the right word, but I think we got a little bit more locally focused and a little less concerned about what was happening uh, in, in other places and looking for inspiration because we really had it near us. That was a much nicer way of putting it than I was going to put it. <laughs> oh, well, now we have to hear your way. <laughs> All right. So take this for what it is. I I still think the community is amazing. And I still think that there are an incredible amount of really amazing contributing makers out there. But you know, in the last five years of going to fairs as an exhibitor, um, and then going to a fair couple fairs last year as a participant, I, I've seen a huge shift in audience type and uh, early on in, in the, the early fairs that I went to, there was always a sense of wonder and a sense of appreciation that you would bring your project and, you know, hoof your heavy equipment, maybe across the state line or at least a, a decent distance away and set it up to share it and show it off to strangers. And everyone was appreciative, the exhibitors and, and the audience. And the last couple of years, the shift that I've seen is an expectation from the audience that, well, of course you would bring your, your project. Where's your YouTube channel? Can I follow you on Instagram? Did you freely share these plans? I want to know how to make this. Where do, where's your blog post on how you made this? Oh, by the way, I saw this guy on YouTube and he did the same project, but he did it better and, and here's why. And I think that you should have done it this way. And it's, it, those people were always there, but it's grown to a level that it really frustrated me. Um, in the last couple of fairs that I've gone to how often I heard conversations like that. Yeah. I don't know. It, the, the sense of wonder seems to be gone in the community. And now there's just a sense of expectation. I think it's, it's still there in, in points. I think maybe yes, still, in points, a, a little bit of old man yells at cloud going on. <laughs> um, I but, yeah. definitely yell at clouds. <laughs> Yeah, it's on this podcast. There's definitely a the, yeah, there's societal change. Everyone has a 3D printer in their, you know, middle school now. You know, there's yep. not as much shine and sheen on some of these things, but people are still out there doing good things and, you know, even if there are people there that are just brushing it off as nothing like you can go and you can talk to that person, you you can be like yeah, this looks really cool. And then they're like, but wait, look at the back of this. Look how it's built. This is built completely different. And, you know, you can still be excited about those kind of things. So it's, yeah, you know, it's still trying to make sure that you don't let the 
the negative people kind of bring it down and that kind of might have had an effect on what's going on now but um you know like you guys said earlier there's still some maker fairs there's still independently uh ran maker events that we can still basically keep with our tribe and and you know it's kind of like you know people that go to burning man you know they they definitely have a very big crowd and that ecosystem has changed and morphed and grown and it's just finding a way to you know keep it palatable and keep it you know doing what it should be doing which is sharing people's passion on making cool things yes there has to be an element of freshness to it too i i completely agree with your point about 3d printers and and we always laugh when we see our uh survey feedback from our attendees because it's inevitably there's somebody who says there's too many 3d printers and there's another person who's like i didn't see enough 3d printers (laughs) um and uh, there's a couple things I've noticed. So one is there's definitely makers who get into an efficiency pattern where they're like, I bring the same things. I know how to set up. I know how I run this. I have my cases. It's all packed. And if you're an attendee, you're walking by like, hey, I I saw this guy last year. Um, so how do we... I think there's there's definitely an element to how do you change it up? How do you um, incorporate some new elements? One of the things that we've done uh, last year, we bought some uh, inexpensive TVs and stands. And so when we do other events now, I try to put uh, just some loop video behind us on the TV just to give a little bit of extra you know texture to what we're showing off and it has the benefit of answering some of the really basic questions and showing some of the, the techniques or other piece, you know, for the, the YouTube generation, it, it, it can help quite a bit. So, um, not saying you fell into that trap and that's why you were feeling that way, but I've definitely seen some people who, who have gotten stuck in an exhibitor pattern and that have received that, that feedback. No, I'm totally in that exhibitor pattern because I'm usually running around like crazy trying to make sure the fair is not burning down. So I just bring the easiest projects and then set them up and then put a picture of me pointing at my face that says, if you have questions about these projects, find the dude with the mustache. Oh, that's funny. (laughs) To to say that I'm going to stay in the same place for 10 minutes at my fair is just asinine that's never going to happen but well, we have a rule that producers don't have projects that's a really good rule but then we break it because a bunch of us have built power racers <laughs> yes <laughs> i just have fun stuff that i really want to show off and so i just i i come for setup day and i put it all in one spot and i stick that picture there and you know a few times i've had people come find me and that's cool like those are the people that are really interested in my projects that they come find me and drag me back to my booth and are like, tell me about this. You know, that the drift trike usually gets somebody to come grab me and ask me what, how I did that. And, you know, I bolted a motor to the back of a tricycle. It's pretty straightforward, but you know, I saw a YouTube video where a guy did a really good job with that. Was it the Colin Furs video? Cause that, that thing, Holy crap. I, I was going back to your earlier point about saying that every time yeah, you saw he, something, somebody says they saw it on a YouTube video. He did he did it better. That's fine. <laughs> See, I, I think a lot of this can be fixed by just making sure every booth has a flamethrower of some kind, like a lot of the big maker fairs. We can't have fire at our fest. Or food. Or according to Aaron Fun. <laughs> the <Yep>. three Fs. <laughs> yes. Tesla coils? Uh, so they haven't said no yet. That's because we haven't brought one yet. Well, I, I had it in the works. I was trying really hard to recreate the dark room of Milwaukee in our fair this year, and I just couldn't get anyone to commit to it, and it killed me inside because that was the best part of Milwaukee, in my opinion. Was Pete did a fantastic job with that dark room. Well, and it was huge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. got, they've got so much space there uh that was yeah that was amazing i went out and bought overhead projectors and slide projectors after that 
we have overhead projectors that I made people keep specifically because of that event. Uh, and Aaron's still kicking them and yelling at me. But, um, you know, we have almost as much space as Milwaukee for our event. Um, and it's absolutely incredible. And we have probably a tenth of the attendees, but about the same amount of exhibitors. Um, we don't have the luxury of the amazing fair to be co-located with us, unfortunately. So yeah, I think Milwaukee's moving this year though. So I don't, they're not going to have that, but they will have indoor power racing is what I understand. What? Uh, I'm so excited. I would love to get up there. I don't think that'll, I don't, I don't see us uh, making that, but uh, it would be, it'd be neat. I'm sad we don't have a power racer yet. Uh, we're trying to convince Jim to do an exhibition race in Akron since we have a lot of indoor space that, you know, it's out of the weather, it's flat, it's smooth. We have a bunch of barriers in the form of steel racks that we can, we can lay down and, and put some sheeting on. So that's one thing that, uh, we'd like to see, uh, if it will come into play now that, uh, New York make affairs off the, the list. We might see about doing something like that in September. So I've had this crazy idea and we haven't tested it yet, but you know, those, um, black, uh, storage bins they sell at you know Home Depot and Lowe's and those places mm-hmm. with the yellow tops. Mm-hmm. Um, if you fill those with water, they might actually make reasonable power racing barricades, and then they stack when you're done. Because we've they... looked at purchasing barricades, and the the downside is just the storage space required is ridiculous. Yeah. And those Jersey barriers are pretty expensive that they use, so. Uh... That's a great idea. Yeah, we've talked about some uh, high-speed camera uh, destruction testing. Uh, we've I, I volunteered my kid's car. I'm not sure he's happy with that, but uh, we talked about turning it into an RC car so that we could, uh, you know, do some do some ramming tests with a high-speed camera. But it hasn't happened yet. There's a little company down the street. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It's called Rubbermaid. Um, yeah, and <laughs> they make all of the big bins right down the street from our space. So hmm. I might, I maybe might you to, can get some blemish ones. I might have to go talk to them to see if they're willing to sponsor something. Seems like a good idea. You know what I love about this conversation? What is we, we went from talking about bad news, a, a company that uh, is being restructured uh, to talking about, our maker events and what we love and talking about what we want to do differently for them in the future. As if that news it's happened, we're dealing with it and we're, we're moving on. Yeah. That's exactly what I wanted to happen this episode. What else do you guys want to add with, uh, not wanting to, to bring more sad things. There's a maker space that recently closed in Michigan called the village workshop. Uh, in Northville, uh, around the Detroit general region. And um, everyone knows I really like tools and equipment. So they are auctioning off all their assets. Um, I am not actually familiar with the space other than what's on their auction site. But if anyone in the next 48 hours uh, from when we're recording this uh, goes on to bidspotter.com, they can find, you just search for The Village Workshop and they're getting rid of all of their things that are no older than three years old. So it's basically a makerspace in a box, uh, a very, very, very well-equipped makerspace in a box. That's really the only thing that I have, other than the fact that I personally just picked up a couple more bandsaws last week because I'm a maniac. (laughs) You can't have too many bandsaws. See, right? Devin has like 16. (laughs) 12, but yeah. (laughs) <laughs> we have a member of our space and um i i love him and we have this amazing natural tension because i tend to be acquirer of things and he tends to be purger of things uh and so we have this this great dance we do about well i could get this other thing and people would like it and he says well where would it go what else are you getting rid of and uh, he, this is Joe, and Joe referred to himself as the reverse 
Little Mermaid the other day, and I laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I'm now going to have that image. And, you know, he was he was literally you know, like twirling around, you know, look at this crap. Where will it go? <laughs> I was like, you know, every makerspace needs needs somebody like Joe to help, uh, you know, try to keep it, try to keep it organized and try to keep it clean. So it, it, is he clean shaven? Uh, wow. Yes. Because I'm the bizarro him. <laughs> OK. OK. And, and 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 Aaron is that to me. I'm always like. Yeah. There's somebody who wants to donate a 60 inch wide fine art plotter to the space. And Aaron's like, where's it going to go, Joe? Can we use the, <laughs> the vertical space for it? Can we mount it on the wall? And I'm like, no, you're an insane person. But look at all the things we can make. <laughs> yeah, I found myself the other day saying, look, it's a deck PDP 11. What more do you need to know? <laughs> <laughs> and the person looking at me was like, what the hell's a deck PDP 11? I'm like, exactly. You should know this. We need a museum. Ah, uh, never mind. So if you start a museum, we have, we have some fun <laughs> things for you. We have, uh, one of the first commercially available barcode scanners and it's the demo oh model. My. That's serial number zero. Uh, I have so, tears in my eyes. <laughs> It's sitting next to our wall clock that's made out of, uh, what is it, like a 12-inch platter from a 10-megabyte hard drive. Wow. Yes. Shiny. Now I want to make a wall clock out of a laser disc. So we're uh, headed to Chattanooga in just a couple days, right? Yes. Yep. Everybody but me. The Nation of Makers Conference, NomCon. I'll be very close to you guys, so I'll be there in spirit, but I won't be there. My first time to Chattanooga. How about you guys? My first as well. I've passed through it, and that's about it. I think that's one of the neat things about this this concept of doing uh, Chattan- uh, doing NomCon in these regional cities is um, you know really getting a chance to see the culture of that city. Uh, I got a ton out of our trip to Santa Fe last year, um, and you know was I. Going to Meow Wolf last year for me was like going to Bay Area the first year. It was just just amazing. Yeah, so I'm really really looking forward to it and uh, looking forward to seeing seeing you guys there. I'm glad we could convince Aaron to to come. Yeah, I'm excited. When do you guys get in? We will be leaving from Ohio with some of the folks from Pittsburgh on Thursday morning, and then driving and getting there like Thursday afternoon. Because it's it's about a oh, okay. nine and a half hour drive from us. I should be there around noon on Friday. Yeah, I get in Thursday night from uh, Boston, and then my plan is to hit the makerspace uh, first thing on Friday and see the magic wheelchair and start integrating stuff. Yeah, I'm just going into this one with just kind of how I did last year was Thursday and Friday are kind of unscheduled, and we'll just kind of yep. see what happens. Like last year showed up early and then we got to spend you know like a full day and a half with um helping to do the setup on the giant rosie the riveter and you know just hang out with a bunch of cool makers and you know get to catch up with people that i've you know met in the past and meet a whole bunch of new friends and it was a good time so that's kind of my plan yeah that that adam guy will be there his new show comes out this weekend oh yeah that one guy yeah I think yeah. I've heard of him. I listened to his book. It was really inspiring. As I was packing this morning, late last night and this morning, I was like, oh, gosh, I got to finish that before I see him. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, you know, add another three pounds to the to the bag. I'm like, wait, I'll just buy it like electronic. No, I've already owned it. Damn it. OK, add another three pounds to the bag <laughs> or whatever a book weighs. The audiobook was great because he has a an enthusiasm that's hard to match for yes he does know, everything and since he narrates it the, his enthusiasm for the stories he tells comes across in the most fantastic way it, i can see the expressions he's making as he's recording it and it yeah. makes me smile i've already i I've, I've honestly listened to it twice and <laughs> since i got it so yeah aaron if you meet him tell him that I said hi, and thanks for the book, and thanks for the inspiration, and it couldn't have come at a better time, you know, because he doesn't know me. I will totally do that. You should. 
So Aaron, when you meet him, you you tell him that Joe didn't come and you need to you need to make fun of him. So that too. Yeah, I, I will take being made fun of by Evan Saddam, which that'd be fine. You know, it's interesting. I've I've actually found that um Adam is a bit of a test for figuring out if people are in our community or not. Because if you're like, oh, do you know of Adam Savage? And they say no, it's like, okay, never mind. <laughs> All never right. mind. The rest of this story, it's no good for you. Yeah. See you later. <laughs> Have you heard of Mythbusters? No. Yeah. It's okay. Never mind. Change subject. Oh, okay. Even my kids know who the Mythbusters are. Let's take two minutes each, real quick. Plug our respective fests and their dates and um, when they are happening. Let's start with you, Devin. I think yours is the next one coming up. Oh, you're asking me way too quick on this. Oh. All right. So Midwest Maker Fest is happening in Peoria, Illinois on August 10th. Uh, it's Saturday only. Our setup is on Friday. If you would like to sign up and be part of our event, which I would absolutely love, um, you sign up at www.ignitepeoria.com and you can sign up there to be an attendee or a sponsor. Make sure you note in your registration form that you would like to be part of Midwest Maker Fest and uh, let us know on the show that you're coming and we'll make sure to bring something extra special for you since you're a listener and part of the club 35 listeners club um we totally have more than 35 listeners guys just so you know uh (laughs) um but yeah midwest maker fest home of the midwest's largest bot brawl no longer home of the world's largest ping pong ball cannon by popular demand um the loudest ping pong ball cannon <laughs> the most the most banned and most hated ping pong ball cannon we're we're talking about having a hall of misfit projects that have been banned and are no longer able to be used by our fest <laughs> oh man there's so many um yeah midwest maker fest come hang out august 10th devon so, not only will be go, we will be going to uh, Detroit Maker Fair July 27th and 28th for Power Racing Series. Um, and it, that's a great Maker Fair. Uh, it's independent, so it's still on. And yes. uh, it's a great, it's, a, it's honestly, it's great because when you get access to the Maker Fair, you get access to the entire Henry Ford, yes. which is fantastic, especially if you're... Uh, tool nut, machinist nerd, fabrication, any kind of old powered anything. They have it all. It's awesome. Uh, and then the Akron Mini Maker Fair is October 12th. Um, we usually set up our ski bowling machine, which is a ski ball machine that's been scaled up to accept bowling balls. So it's five foot by 20 foot by eight foot. Um, Do they jump? Uh, yeah, the ramp is actually at eye level is where the ramp starts. So you're usually, the bowling balls are usually launching about six to seven feet in the air. What's the date yes. for this event? Uh, <laughs> October 12th. Ah, <laughs> oh, it's the same weekend as Earth. Ah. Oh. Well, we... What are you guys doing? We will have it, I believe we will have it at Detroit. And there's talk of taking it to a couple other maker fairs. Um, so yeah, last, last year at New York, it was a a pretty big hit. They had us in the middle of the concourse. Um, so that was a good time and we've taken it to a bunch of other stuff and we usually take it to Cleveland Ingenuity Fest, which is very similar to what you guys have over there in Peoria, where it's like a making and arts and flamethrowers and there's a whole band that's nothing but Tesla coils. So it's it's a really good time. We don't have a Tesla coil band or flamethrowers, unfortunately, but we do have a really incredible arts and creation fair and um, all of that stuff. We do. We really we have debated for the last two years to have a spinoff fest called Midwest Danger Fest (laughs) with all of our band projects and more things like Tesla coil bands and flamethrowers. So maybe I need a great name. Right? I know. The branding alone sells it. It's amazing. We'll give you one of the signs from our shop. It says it doesn't have to be safe, but you have to do it safely. Ooh, that's good. That's good. That is good. 
Ian, you want to plug yours? Sure. Maker Fair Orlando, November 9th and 10th. Um, boy, we'd love to have ski bowling if uh, if that's available. Mm-hmm. I remember last year when we, we saw the uh, the post coming out of New York on that, we got pretty, pretty excited. I'm pretty sure I posted it on Facebook and mm-hmm. challenged anyone locally to build one for me. <laughs> that works a surprising number of times, but... Yeah, so we're a two-day event, uh, 300 plus uh, exhibitors, hands-on workshops, uh, combat robots. Uh, we've got a small arena and a big arena, so we fight up to the 250-pound class. Uh, usually have a bunch of the bots from uh, that TV show that's kind of popular right now. Uh, actually, some some really really uh, great people, and they also help us put on the put on the robot event. We've got power racing series. We will teach 800 to 1,000 people to make a shirt. We'll teach 800 to 1,000 people to solder. Uh, power tool racing, um, you name it, we try, to, we try to do it. Something for everyone. And uh, as we uh, discussed earlier, it won't be snowing. All right. Well, with that, Aaron, did you have anything you wanted to add to all this? Nope, I'm good. You were so quiet this episode. I have zero experience in any of this. <laughs> then okay. you're not biased yeah i mean honestly <laughs> well ian Devin, i'm super glad you guys came on uh it was amazing to have um such well-versed people on the show to talk about this topic um if you guys ever want to come back on again you're more than welcome obviously Devin, you've been on twice now and extra fun thank you uh with all of that uh keep making stuff and keep throwing events to show it off <laughs> yes now, now's your turn Aaron. Oh. this is the end of the podcast <laughs>